One of the persons who made a great impression on me as I serve on the board of the St. George's School was our guest speaker for the evening, who also is a member of this congregation. The idea to have Mrs. Cicely Malone speak on this topic came about a few months ago before I had the idea of doing the Lenten series. When I brought together some people from the church, from the schools, and from the community, because I felt, given my experience on the island, that one of the things that were necessary for the BVI, particularly for our schools, was that there should be a parenting institution. What do I mean by a parenting institution? Why the need for a parenting institution? I'm certain that Ms. Cicely Malone will give you more along that line. But certainly, when we look at the trajectory the trajectory, sorry, of our society, I believe that there are more than enough reasons for us to worry about where our young people are going. And if our young people are the parents of the future, then we have even more to be worried about. A few Saturdays ago, I had the honor, sad as it was, to be officiate at the funeral at a young man who lost his life in this territory. And I always say that had I remained in the back of the church for much longer, I would no longer be a priest. I would have become a high priest because there was so much marijuana being smoked at the back on church property. Now, years ago, no one would hardly have thought about doing something like that in the environment, in the environs of a church. But that is what our young people were doing right next to the church office at the back. And when you look at that behavior and you ask, these may very well be young people who will become mummies and daddies of the future. And then what example will they be giving to their, ch giving to their children? I think the need for parenting education is one that needs to be discussed. It is a discussion that we need to have. And as I said, I believe that Ms. Cicely Malone, who was recently honored to become a member of the British Empire, is most adequately suited to develop on that topic. Like I said, at the meeting we had, Ms. Malone started and we, were just sat, we just sat there and listened to the wisdom of years coming out. And we said, but the answers are right here. We have suitable people on our island who have the skills, who understand the processes, who understand what is going on. And all we need to do is to bring them together and form something that can help parenting in the island. It is my hope and privilege that if we can find financing for it, to launch a parenting institution beginning in St. George's School and then moving out to the community. We are going to be having some discussions with UNICEF in the not too distant future. In January, when I went to Barbados, I had the opportunity of meeting with the director of Paradox, Parenting and Education in Barbados. And she explained to me what Paradox has been doing for the good of the community of Barbados. Has it solved all the problems in Barbados? Definitely no. Are there not still problems in Barbados? Definitely yes. But at least it is a step in the right direction. Um, the challenge we have will be to get the message across. If you look at our gathering this evening, I believe it is disappointing that we have so many parents in our schools, in our society, and this has been out on the bulletin board. We've sent it out to the PTAs, and a handful of people have turned up. And that speaks to the, not only the need to talk about parenting education, but the need to establish why parenting education is important. And so, without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce your guest speaker for the evening, Mrs. Cicely Malone. Thank you, Father Rock, and good evening to each and every one of you. I welcome you here this evening just to touch 
on a small part of parenting. Most of what you see in your brochure is just general parenting, but there are specifics in parenting. But before I go into that, I will tell you some things about myself. When you are young, you hear par um, people saying you need to ask God for the things you want. I asked him for four things, and I got the four. A husband, four children, a home, and to be the best teacher that I could be. I am still working on that one, being the best teacher that I could be. Um, it, I, I must say it is good I grew up the time that I grew up. Because I was very mischievous, like quite a number of little children. And... But that time, when I grew up, the village raised the child. You had the home, you had the school, you had a community which included the child, the church. And you did not have a choice whether you were going to church or not. On Sundays, we went to, we came here to Sunday school in that hall there. We came to Sunday school, then our parents came and we came to church with them. And there was a Sunday school in the village in the afternoon. We also went to that Sunday school. So we got a lot of the Bible. But as I grew older, I said, going to church and going to Sunday school does not make it doesn't make you spiritual. Spirituality is something that is developed. And if you look in your brochure, um, I have where you will develop through the years um, the principles that govern your thinking and your actions. And that's what spirituality is. Yes, the church helps, but going just to church and going to Sunday school is not going to develop it. We have to do more. And the more is done in the home with parents. It is done also at the schools. So we have to put more time in what we are doing with our children. I am saying that because we, they, to me, right now, children are not getting enough ad, of adults in their lives. Um, our community has changed. It started changes, changing from the 80s. Um, before that, we had an agricultural economy. The economy changed when tourism and financial services were introduced. And parents started going to the workplace. So a child went home, maybe to an, a member of the extended family before, but grandmother um, children and mother were also in the workplace. So children are going home now. Sometimes they're on their own for some hours before the parents come. And in that time, we know how mischievous we are as little people. And at that time, they get with other persons who are not, at, um, who, are, who don't have parents in, so they form their little groups. And when they form their little groups, they start thinking about things that they would do. And that happens, they grow up. They grow up, but they are not developing because it needs somebody to help the development of children. You cannot just, they're not because they're running and playing. Yes, physically, they are developing physically, but the thinking and the thoughts that we expect our children to have, when they reach to the level of self-actualization, that is the mature level, we expect them 
to have certain qualities that will guide them in their adult life. And if they don't get that on the way up, then we are in trouble. And that is one of the things that's bothering me now with our society. Several of those young people that were killed, I, I either taught or they were at Enid Catliff when I was principal. It, my heart bleeds for my community when I see our young people being killed, killing each other like that. The young lady who was locked up, I still, although I am retired, I still work with a, a second chance program. That young lady was in our program. And when I heard that, I could not believe that she would allow anyone to lead her to the point where she would do something like that. Those are the things that's hurting me as a human, as a parent, as a grandparent, as a teacher. Those things hurt me a lot. I said that to my group. I say, whatever happens to you, when it hurts you, it hurts me. Because I spend the evenings with you all. And that is the reason why we are trying to see how much we can do to help them to understand that there is more to life than money. Somehow or the other, we didn't have money before and we were happier for it. As soon as we start getting money, we forget our friends, we forget family. Family, what is family now? How do we introduce our children to their family, the extended family? Do they know who their family, who they are? Whether they are, um, their father isn't there or whatever. I continue to hear in this community that we cannot raise our children because the father is not in the home. We are, we, that's a thought in our head, but it can happen without the father in the home. I told you I have four children, I had five. Three were in marriage, two outside. And I raised my children. For the young men, I found somebody who was respectable as a man. And that person was who they interacted with because I believe they should have a male figure if they are. The girls should, um, should too, but the boys especially should have a male figure. So if the dad isn't there, there are enough persons around who you can attach your children to, who they grew up around, so they learn certain things that the mother can't teach them. But the whole idea of parenting starts from the early years. Um, I read Aristotle. I, I, Aristotle said, it is not that the early years are important, but the early years are the only thing that's important in raising that child. And the early years start from birth until that child is eight. Uh, you can see the change in a child from seven, where they want to, to tell you what they want to do, and instead of listening to what you would like them to do. So if we allow those first eight years to slip by, then we are going to have some challenges. When I say challenges, I mean challenges. Because I listen to some young people and the way they talk to their parents. I am sorry. Uh, one right here. <laughs> she could tell you that I like to slap. When they were growing up, you be careful how you talk to me because I like to slap. I slap it in your mouth. You are not going to talk to me how you would like to. And today we are loving our little people I was walking the street some time ago and I saw this little person, couldn't be no more than four, and all you were hearing were obscene language to the mother. 
the mother calling him, and all you hear in his obscene language. That didn't just happen, because children learn language from us. If we do not talk, our children will not learn to talk. If we do not read to them, they will not learn to read. So they learn language from the adults around them. And it's no accident that he's saying this, because that's what he was hearing. He heard whether the environment he was in was that or not. He was using the language, and she tried, she got so mad, she walked away, leave him behind. And then he started to cry. And then that's when she came and she um, held him by his hand. But this is something, uh, in raising children, it is not about what we give them. It is how we help them to develop. It's development. Children will grow because you're going to give them food. Uh, um, you see Maslow have here their needs. And I put the first one at the bottom because I look at it that the younger years, these are extremely important. But as the child grows up to um, becoming self-actualization, uh, self let us look at the first level, the physical needs. Not the one in the middle. The one in the middle is more for the adult, the human adult need for jobs and so. But look in your, in, in, in your, in your brochure, and you're going to see here a Maslow's hierarchy of needs made simple. And the first one down to the bottom is the physical needs. Need for food, air, clean water, and shelter. We know that is, that's physically we have to provide those things for our children. But the second level, safety. The children need to know that they are safe, that there is consistency in what you are doing with them. Now, a number of times we do it today, and then tomorrow we allow it to pass. It has to be consistent. Parenting is not something that we do now and we drop it and we pick it up. It's consistent remind, uh, reminding. And I think that's what people get um, upset about, that you have to continue to remind the child, remind the child. Even at school, I am an early childhood educator. I spent 43 years of my life in early childhood. And I fought to stay there because when the authorities he saw I was good at mathematics. They wanted to send me high school. And I was going away to study. I tell them, if you send me high school, better I go and work in a bank. And that's when they say, go and study what you want, early childhood. And they, when I said that, after I said that, they allowed me to do early childhood. And that's what I wanted to, to do because reading education, you found out that those early years in a child's love, life extremely important, not just in the school, but at the home, that what the parent does with that child at home and at school. And I say, as you come to church and you bring them also to Sunday school, sit in Sunday school with your child. You don't have to um, just send the child, but accompany the child. Um, level three, needs for attention. You know, as your child grows older and they become very close to you, um, sometimes they come nagging you, mammy, mammy, mammy. Um, and it's some little thing that they want, but you need to listen. It's your child. We have to have that kind of feeling for our children. They're us, we give birth to them, and we are responsible for what happens to them. They like to know that they're important. When, you, when they do something, praise them for it. Because they, the little children want to help you do something more than the older ones, you know. And if you use that time when they're little like that and help them have the patience with them, because it calls for patience, and let them do what they're going to do. It's not going to be perfect. 
at the beginning, I remember seeing a four-year-old with her mother in the laundry and she folding towels. And that child knew to put the towels under her neck and fold them. I asked the mother, how old is this child? She's four. And that is because she allowed her to practice it. And we have to have patience with our children. We are all in the workplace, but we cannot, it cannot be that we leave our children up for everybody else to raise. Because if we are not raising our children as parents, somebody else is going to raise them for us. And those who are raising them for us, you, uh, you, we see where they're ending up into a lot of trouble. So we have to find the time to raise our children. Level four, if you do all that you are supposed to do, satisfy their little egos, then they develop self-esteem. They feel good about themselves. When a child feels good about himself, uh, about himself or herself, then you find that that child tries to do the things because you know has developed a relationship with your child. They try to do the things that will please you. There is a stage coming where you're not going to be important. After they make eight, nine, is their peers. What their peers say is important then. And I wouldn't talk about when they reach to the preteen and the teenagers. Oh, you, you old fashioned. Their, their peers are the ones who know. So you have to have that relationship from very early so that that child, uh, when they grow older and they become teenagers and the teenagers start telling them, oh, your mother have your bag up. I hear that so many times that I, my response was, you are mine, so I can bag you up. Because they want their friends, their friends want them to go somewhere, and you know, no, it's school. When it's school night, you can't go anywhere else but home and your homework. Where there are time, there's a time coming when you can go where you want to go. But right now in school, it's homework, your chores, and homework. When you get home, there are things our children can do to help. Parents are tearing out themselves and have little people who can help them, but they don't have the patience to do what they have to do with the child. And you have to develop that patience. Parenting call for patience. It's hard work, and it calls for patience. But the end result, if you put the time in, you will be proud of the end result. I am telling you, yes, it's a lot of time. It takes a lot from you. But when your children are grown, and you see them become responsible people in society, that's the end result. That's when you feel proud. Well, I did my job. And now they are responsible for themselves. The last one is the one, um, level five, where you take them, now they're, they're matured, they're grown. And now they're, they have, they're growing spiritually because we have taught them certain things. They're growing spiritually. They know about helping others. They're thinking morally about what they're going to do. That is the stage we want to bring them at. If we get them at that stage, then we have done our job. And we have to put the time in. It calls for time in raising children. It, just not, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. And quite a number of us, do not want to go through the process. And one of the, when I reach over to um, the, some of the points that I would like you to consider, we're going to look at how the process, how it works. 
because we cannot have our children and just leave them to themselves. I know we are in a working community, but it's our responsibility as parents. If you have a child, you have to make sure you know where your child is. You have to know where, who your child is with. And those are some of the things that I identify here. You must know. You must know the person your child is with. I used to allow my children to bring their friends in my, in my home. Um, the one who, uh, I have a child that passed just like that. That child was the only child that said an obscene word to me. And that day, I went and I got a stick and I hit him to hair. When I hit him the second one, he said, I understand, mommy. He was a basketball player and he used to be with all kind of boys. They used to come to my home. And he made sure, he told them, my mother hates bad words with a passion. Because I always say that to them. Don't use an obscene language to me. Then when you get me upset, is when you, cause, you swear words to me. When I was growing up, the only people who used to use swear words were the drunken people. When they get drunk, you hear them swearing. But they never, anybody else, they never use swear words to you. And so I hated them with a passion. And he was with all these boys. He brought them home. But he remembered that one Sunday afternoon when he got those two sticks because... I was not a beaten parent. I talk a lot, but I was not a beaten parent. But when he see that I hit him, he knew that I was upset. There are times when we have to correct it on the instant. We don't put it up. Some people put up. You don't put it up. You correct it right there and then. You don't wait until tomorrow and you put them together and then you want to kill the child. Correct it as they make the mistake, you correct it immediately. I am going to leave out the participants activity. You can do that um, sometime on your own, where it says you choose six qualities that you would like to develop in your child or your children from the words below. And then you will say um, why you chose, chose those six. But we will, we will deal with that at a, um, another time. You can do it for yourself, and you can decide what qualities do I really want. Because as I said, we continue to think, carrying our children to school, we are educating them. No, we are schooling them. Education and schooling are two different things. And that is something I'm going to talk about. Because being an educator, I notice that people continue to drill children without understanding. You cannot drill children and think they're understanding. You have to explain first. Help the child to understand first before you drill. And if it seems as if it's becoming a big thing in education now. You just drill them. And they go and they write an exam. Take the question that they had in that exam that was written by the teacher and write it a different way. You'll find out whether your child is being educated or not. The minute you change the words are wrong, they cannot answer the question. And parents are some who fuel in they sort of behavior. Because the teachers will tell you, or oh, the parents say you ain't teaching their children anything. So they, they resort to drilling. Development takes a long time. It, it doesn't happen overnight. You start, and then you find out the child might have forgotten something. You have to go back and revise it again. And we cannot continue to drill information into our children and not develop their thinking, or else we're going to have more and more mothers. We cannot, because our children cannot analyze, 
which is, so, is one of the qualities we need for life. You have to be able to think about something, analyze it, see the pros and the cons of it before you decide to use it. And that is one of the things that's happening to our children. They're not being able to analyze. They cannot think. They, their friends say this, we go in so and so. They ask in any question, why are we going here? What are we going here to do? Those are the questions um, that you expect your children to ask, but they're not asking the question because the brain is already conditioned. Brain development starts from time that child is in your womb. And after that child comes out, you continue to stimulate that brain. You look right into your child's face and you talk to your child. That's the way your child learns to talk. When I take, I take people babies all the time and talk to them, and you only see this little tongue going up in the roof of the mouth because they're seeing your tongue moving. And there's going up, but they're not ready to make the sound yet. But if you continually doing it, the children will learn to make their sound, and they will learn to say words very early without language. Our children cannot learn. And lang because they new need language for every subject that they're doing. So not helping them to develop language, we are putting our children at a disadvantage. So that is one of the things that when I was with the daycare people, I used to say to them, the last thing for your baby in the night is for you to sing to them or read to them. And I'm saying it, parents, sing to your children or read to them. When they learn to read, let them read to you. And the books, how do you choose books for little children? For little children, you choose books that have huge pictures and a few words. The child is going to look at that picture and that child is going to develop his own story from that picture. As the child grows older, the pictures become smaller, more words are introduced. And reading is important, extremely important for success. When you go to the workplace, you have to be able to read. So we have a new gadgets that's taken away the time from reading, and what is happening is, I don't know what people, parents feel, that if their child don't have this gadget when they are three and four, they're not losing out anything. But everybody wants to have it because somebody else has it. There is nothing in this world that can replace the human voice. You put in your children and they sing, say, oh, they're listening to our story. Oh, they're playing a game. Who are they interacting with? We talk about holistic education. Holistic education involves more than the intellectual. It's being sociable. It's being physical. It's being emotional. All of those. And those things, you will see it in your um, thing that... Our Education Act 2004 speaks to that. The institution must be developed to develop our children in that way. Home is an institution, the first institution for our children. So in the home, we're going to do the things with them. Long time ago, before these gadgets were in, invented, we used to play board games. We used to put puzzles together. We are interacting with our children while we are doing something. We need to put those things aside for a while. I'm going to tell you something that my cousin told me in 2013. I went to New York and with, was with my cousin. She is a scout leader. They took the American scouts to China. When they were with the Chinese, 
the notice they didn't have any cell phones and all of that. So the scouts asked them, how come y'all don't have cell phones and y'all make them? The answer was, when we leave school in the afternoon, we have our chores to do. And after our chores, we have homework. That's what it used to be in the BVI. We have gone far away from what used to be. And if we don't have these things, we feel that we are not important. No, you have to raise your child. And you have to raise your child to be in the workplace. You have to raise your child to go abroad with, uh, to, uh, with, in other countries. You have to raise your child to be sociable, to be, uh, understand people's emotion and all of that. And for us to understand their emotion. Because that we are emotional beings. And we have to know what to say and when to say it and how to say it to our children. Our children are a stamp of their parent. So what we do with them, you see it coming out in you. I see a lot of me and my children now that they're grown. A lot of me, some of the things that they do, especially this one. <laughs> Like to, like to feed people, <laughs> especially this one. But this is what we as parents, God give us a child. It's a gift. We need to take care of them. We cannot allow them to just roam with anybody. Our boys, I know when I was growing up, and a boy is in the village too late. And one of the men said to him, go home. And he didn't go home, he would beat them. I bet he went home then. That would be them. So the village did raise the children at that time. But today's parents, I had, while I was at school, I had a child that I see he needed extra help. So I said to the aunt one day, why don't you help your nephew? He's getting into too much trouble. Her answer was, my sister say, I leave my child. So they, their hands were off. The family helps to raise their children. And if you know that you need help, it's better you look for help than to wait until the child end up in prison and start to cry or end up when they're going to be buried. We have to put some more time. And it's not just the parents. Society has to put some more time into helping our children. Because it's the, we, we know, we are aware that a lot of the parents are young. They have not a clue what they are doing with their children. They think is the more things they give them is going to help them develop. That's not true. They are learning, the children are learning that I could get things. They didn't work for it. They didn't have to do anything for it. Parents just saw it and they liked it and they bought it and gave it to them. We, uh, that you put your children to, do, children to do certain things and then you reward them for what they do. Yes, we have to give them the basic things. We know what the basic things are. Maslow told us about them. Those basic things we must give them. But the extras, make your children do something where they can get this or that. Don't just give it because you can afford to buy it. I used to tell my, I don't have a lot of money. And the little bit that I have, is to put aside for you all to go to school. You need higher education. Higher education today in this society, we need higher education for our children. And we cannot just um, give them the, the things because we can afford to give it to them. Let us think about getting them educated to a level where they can make life for themselves. The young men, no matter who they are, they're going to look for somebody's daughter. 
So if you see a young man going wrong, correct him. You don't know if it is in your daughter he's going to come and both of them going to say, well, we're in love. And the next thing you know, they want to get married. Correct them. Or boys, or boys, or boys. From teaching infants, I had 25 boys and 5 girls. Because I was tired in staff meeting, hearing the teachers complaining about the boys. I was a tomboy, so I could have taken them outside. I wasn't afraid of the lizard. I wasn't afraid of the frogs. I wasn't afraid of all of those. So when we catch them, we come inside and we did their reading lesson from that. Whatever we did outside, that was their reading lesson. They say to me, I put it in proper English and that became their reading lesson. They learned to read. Today, you, you hear them say, we cannot find enough information for boys. Make some. Make some. Parents can make some. Find something that you could put together and reuse simple words first. Don't go give the child a big long word and tell it, telling somebody my child could spell this word. Because I know that most of the big words are break up into syllables. But it's better to teach them the syllables first before you go and give them any long word. Because some people write long words and give them and think that means that the child can read. It doesn't mean so. So we need to look at all of that when we are dealing with our children. And I go to now some points to consider. Number one, somebody read that for me. I sweat into this. Number one is on the, on the inside. Number one. Right, and you see there, see Maslow's hierarchy of needs made simple? That's this here. So when you're on your own, you can look at this. I have two Maslow's, one for the basic needs and another one, this one is for the workplace. And if you look at it, in the, look at, I want you to look at it seriously because some of the things that he has there is exactly what the workers say today. Number two. Leave your child with other adults, relatives, or friends sometimes so that they can develop a relationship and realize other adults can care for him or her. Yes, we, our children go to the care centers. That's, I was a coordinator for early childhood. I did it for eight years. One of the things that bothered me was the caregivers were doing everything for this child. Even the last bath and the last bottle before that child go to sleep. How many waking hours then does that child have with a parent? I went and I said to the caregivers, you all need to leave the last bath and the last bottle for the parent. The parent went back and tell them they're paying them. So they must do their arm. Um. <laughs> Who are our children bonding with? If I don't bond with you, you can't tell me anything. And this is where the breakdown is in parenting in this society. Our children are leaving their parents at Two months. We tried to put in place three months, but seemingly that didn't work. Leaving their parents at two months, going to a stranger. First year, one. Second year, another stranger. Third year, another one. Fourth year, another one. Then in the school system. Who are our children bonding with? How do we expect? that we are going to have that relationship with our children, that our children will listen to us. What is happening in our society now is not an accident. It's what we have developed. We have developed that because no one, the, your waking time, that child reach, reaches home, that child wants to sleep. So who are our children bonding with? 
who are they feeling the love from? When that baby is three months and they start, and they start smiling, whose face are they smiling into? When that baby is being fed, whose face are they looking into? Is it the parent or is it a stranger? That is something that we are not paying attention to in this society. We have created what we now have. I don't know how we are going to turn it back. For it took us years to get here. And I know it cannot change in a snap of the finger. That is one of the things um, I talk about. Another one is read to your child to help him or her develop language. And I talk about the books already. Call objects and things by their correct name. Don't, as long as you have a young child growing up, whatever it is, parts of the body, whatever, call it by the correct name. Let children learn the correct name. It's their body. It's your body. It's my body. It has a name. Call it by the name. Another one, have your child help fold towels, sort the cutlery, and give them different little tasks to do. You know what I smile at and I continue to say to parents? When children are three, they want to come help you wash the dishes. And the first thing you say, oh, you're going to wet up yourself. Oh, you can't do it yet. When they reach five and six, and you want them to wash the dishes, they don't want to do it then. That, it has gone. That interest has gone. When they want to wash the dishes, you could take out the shirt. They ain't going to be able to. <laughs> Let me see if it's still on. It's on. They ain't going to be able to wash them perfectly, but they're going to be able to do something. When the interest is there, you monopolize on the interest for your child. Don't have your child just running around doing nothing. They learn how to be lazy. They learn how to do nothing. Even in the classroom, you have it so hard to motivate some students in the classroom because they're not customer doing anything. So we have to make sure that we give our children the little chores that they can do. When you tell them, put up their toys, and they cry, do not put them up. I love them, let them know that's your toys, you are responsible for those toys, and you are to put them back in the place where they're supposed to go. So those are things that we just do for them because we feel they're little. Oh, is it while they're little they learn all these things? When they make nine days studying you, is their friends as important, their peers? And as they grow older, is more of their peers when they become teenagers. It's not you then. Put in your foundation when you have that time, when they're going to give you that time, so that when they get older, you wouldn't have to be fighting with them. So putting in the foundation is extremely important. Um, number six, okay, I, I, got, I, I have something here bold, and I wrote it like that because remember, children are imitators, words and action. They look at the adults, and what the adults do, they do it too. Little children imitate you, and the swear words that we are now hearing as the, um, it sounds like the English words now for them. I have quite a number of young men in the evening. And when they are outside in a social conversation, what do I hear? Pure obscene language. And I said to them one evening, y'all don't have any respect. All of us here, most of who are in there, teachers, are professionals from the society. Y'all don't have any respect. 
one said to me, we are talking the black language. I said, which black? I say yours, not mine. I said, who fool you? That that's the black people language. I said, no way. Not yours, but not mine. You all need to learn the English language because when you go to write, I continue to say to them and I go and wait and see it. When you all go to write your exam, those same words are going to come up as an English word. <laughs> I expect to see it because that's all they talk. <laughs> Be friendly with your children while maintaining your parental role. Yes, some people are friends with their children, but they're afraid to correct them. You cannot be afraid to correct your child when the child is wrong. Not because they are friends. You have to be able to correct them. Discuss current activities and current events with your child, whatever is happening around you. Our children know nothing about those, at, at, at least that I have, don't know a thing about BVI. They don't know because they spend their time on a television, a phone, an iPad, or something. What's happening in the community, they know not. Even you have social studies classes, and you ask them that the teachers now start asking them to bring a news item every, the beginning of every class, so that they start now looking and they don't start looking, you know. Some of them come in, in the classroom with their phones and go on the phone then to look to see what the news item is. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> develop a respectful relationship with everyone involved in your child's life. Example, family members. Whether you like your auntie or, your, uh, or you don't like your auntie, you should not show that to your child. As a family member, regardless of what you had or what you didn't have, you should have that respectful relationship. You don't have to love them to respect them because we don't have to love everybody around us to respect. We have to respect people. Try to prevent risky behaviors. And this one, those about there was when the child is very young. Now, this, from here on, is when the child has grown a bit older. Set realistic limits and enforce them. When you tell your child that on Monday to Friday, they're not going downtown, you mean that. When you tell your child that on Saturday you're not going downtown, you mean that. Regardless of who say, you mean that. We are, our children are getting too many messages. You gave them one, and then when somebody comes and says say something, you break it. No. You have to be realistic with children. Do not give them too many messages because then, you know what's going to happen? They're going to start distrusting their mother and their father. And you don't want your children to distrust you. You say one thing, we're going to, stay, we're going to stick to it. Unless there is a reasonable compromise. It has to be reasonable. Not because the friend, your, your neighbor, the boy is going down the road, yours going with him. Mm -mm. That one is not reasonable. I know my children used to be told, yeah, your mother have your bag up. I bag them up and today they could go wherever they want to go. <laughs> um, know, know how your child reacts in various situations. These bullets here um, belong to setting your, um, your realistic limits and enforcing them. Attend church and Sunday school together. Come to Sunday school with your children sometime. I see in the parents, but you, you are, I will pass on the message. <laughs> um, develop membership in a service club. I say service because our children need to learn that they need to help 
others. And that's why I put a service club, because our children nowadays don't want to do anything for anyone. They don't want to do for themselves. I wouldn't talk about anyone else. Any changes you identify in your child, because you, you will see the difference when your child starts doing different things. You need to mediate immediately. Talk to your child to find out what is really going on. You need to know what is going on. And you need to put in place what you need to put in place so that your child, because some children are bullied at school. Some children are afraid to go back to school. Some children, um, different people take away their stuff. When you see a change in your child, find out what is going on and try to do what you can to help that child. Maintain a positive relationship with your child. It's your child. They're going to get angry with you. Mom used to go in her room and, and shut up the door. That was not trouble to me. I, but you still wasn't going where I'd tell you're not going. That's it. So you could go in the room and shut the door. It's your room. You stay in there. And when you cool down, you come back out. It's no problem to me. But you're not going. That's it. And it, um, that is, I think, a lot of us, feel if we do those things to children, um, somebody will tell you, oh, they're going to become, uh, um, they, they will have psychological problems. No, you balance psychological, you balance the no and the yes. You balance them. So if you balance them, they will not have any psychological problem. People like to tell you, oh, if you do this, if you talk too bad to them. I used to talk, talk, talk. I, I didn't hit, hit, hit by talk, talk, talk. Mani um, number eight, monitor, monitor your child's contact, persons, and place. Know your child friends. Communicate with them. Let them visit your home. You only can know that person who you, is your child friend uh, until you bring them right inside your house. They cannot for a long time, don't show who they are. As long as they're by you for two, an hour or so, they're going to show who they are. So you need to know who the friends are. You need to know that for many reasons. Because if you don't know, and you hear your children getting into this and your children getting into that, you wonder why. It's then you find out who your children were hanging with. So that is something you need to pay attention to. Find out how your child and friends are getting to an event and how they would get and how they would get home afterwards. We have two wood here. Um, yes, when they reach a certain age and you trust them enough, you allow them you can't keep them in all the time. When they grow a certain age, as, as, as long as it is not a school night, um, as long as it's not a school night, we are going to give them a chance to go somewhere. Discuss with your child the activities that you attended when you were his or her age. Take your child out for lunch sometime. Move as a family as many times as possible. Number nine, be a role model for your child at home and outside. Put objects in their correct places. You move it, put it back. And the child has to learn to do that. You move it from there, put it back there. That's where it belongs. That's the place for that. Be respectful to others. There are some young parents, nobody don't care what they say to who. And the child is right there. Do not take what is not yours. There is something that we do all the time and we have our children be behind us. We go into the supermarket, the people grapes there, and we taste in them. And our children see us doing it. How young that child is? Impression. 
This word is not yours. How are you going to go in the people's place and take out? When you go to, uh, to pick up a bag of grapes, you see so many grapes missing. People gone in and they took out the grapes. And a lot of them, their children are with them. It's those simple things that we do unconsciously. Our children learn, and they learn to go in and take up the people's grapes later on. Set, <laughs> set the standards while your child is young. I said, brought to eight years. Set your standards and continue to model them. And the last one I have here for you. Parenting is about talking and listening. And most of all, compromising. There are some times we have to compromise, but we have to do it sensibly. It is not an easy task. Love your children. Raise them positively. After all, they're a blessing from God. That's the way I look at it as a child. That child is no accident. People say it's an accident. A child is not an accident. If you believe your child is an accident, you treat it like an accident. If you have a child, that's a blessing. God give you a child, take care of it. And I put these quotes in here because I still contribute to education magazines. And this one is from February 2018. Why we want our children to excel in math, science, language arts, and social studies. Those skills alone and not, aren't enough for success in our ever-changing 21st century society and economy. Students must also develop essential capabilities like resiliency, adaptability, and collaboration that equip them for the demands of the world today. Being able to, regardless of what it is, be able to stand strong and do what you have to do. You go in the workplace, it's different from home. Be able to adapt to the rules there. You can't go in there and expect to behave the way you were behaving at home. So those are things that we need our children to have. They also need empathy and social awareness to be good citizens and neighbors to contribute to our community and to sustain a flourishing society. One word is missing. And then I had this one from a young professional. Without struggles in life, one cannot build character. And that's why I was saying you de develop. You you're going to grow anyway. But it's what you do with your child that helps your child to develop into the person that you want that child to be. To reach self-actualization. You have to do it with them. Parenting is not an accident. Parenting is work. And I wrote... How can a brain develop when the child is not given practical experience to help, help it develop? There are too many persons looking at the end product and not at the process. You have to have a process to raise that child. It is during the process that development takes place. And I thank you all for boring you. <laughs> Depression. A parent might be Mind depressed and then you it affects the child. I'm starting from the bottom. We talk about depression. And it's a problem when you have children and parents. Parents never want to accept that their child needs other help. And that is a problem. I thought by now it would have changed, but it is still a problem. There are agencies in the community that can help, but the parents just don't want, um, yes. They're, but they're still in, I know at the beginning they would be in denial, but if something is happening consistently, you know you need help. And the other part where 
They don't want the extended family. That is something that is now cropping up in this society. Before, when uh, I grew up in a large family, and I was not biological to the lady who raised me. I was her godchild. But I was one girl among a set of boys. One of the things that she did and that I learned from her was at summertime, we visited family. So wherever they were, we visited family. And that family, if there was somebody in the family that had a child that they know they could not take care of, they surrounded that child and took care of that child. That does not exist anymore. Um, so the whole idea of the family coming together, that's one of the things we're going to have to try to get to happen where relatives and family, yes, you would have misunderstanding, yes, you would have problems, but you need to be able to function with each other to help, especially those children who we know at risk because we have quite a number of young people who are really at risk. And dealing with the young people in the night, I am saying to them all the time, none of you go get any children now. Wait. Because I know they will not be able to parent that child. Not because they themselves don't have the skills and the behavior they are to parent a child. And this is what is happening in society. A number, I was a young parent, so I don't knock young parents. But we were trained in a certain way. I was a very young parent. And I learned that you have a child, you have to do positive things to raise that child. And in, in society right now, I don't know what, how can we change it, and what can we do? Maybe you are in the workplace, now you can tell me I'm out loud. <laughs> I am out so long ago now, Beverly, you might be able to tell me. What's the other question? About um, technology enhancing and the, enriching the, learning. Yeah, um, tech. Technology. technology, as you were mentioning earlier, digital devices. Oh, um, I understand what you were saying about them taking away from the practical, the concrete, mm -hmm. and so on. Because um, yes, but. that that um, I have nothing against technology, but how it's introduced and when it's introduced. That's what that's what I am looking at. The very young child. For that child. Learning language is extremely, is at the top of the list for learning with young children. And um, the technology is a one-sided thing. You need to have a human voice talking to those young children. Not giving them a gadget and they're just listening and they, they do not learn to listen to your voice after a certain time. Because they're young and they're listening to this audio from, um, from their whatever it is, then they, they learn to tune you out very young. And that is, that is a problem. Because if they tune you out so young, learning is not going to take place in the classroom. You're going to have a challenge in the classroom. And I heard a professor from one of the American universities said that the earlier you introduce it, the least your children learn to read. I am now having students in alternative saying to me, it happened before, years ago, where a student said to me, Miss Malone, I can read, but I do not understand what I read. I said, then you can't read. 
You are reading the printed word. You have to, that's one way that you receive language from reading. That's receptive speaking and, and reading. You receive in language. And if you can't understand it, it means you can't read. Now I'm hearing it more and more from the young people that I deal with. I know they don't read. Even though they have homework to do, I know they don't read. And this is one of my concerns. Are we going to be developing a set, a set of illiterate persons in our community because of all the technology that's there? It has its place, but we need to monitor how we give it to our children and how they use it. And that is not happening. So I am hoping that somebody will decide we can't do it this, not, this any longer. We have to change. Thank you. For those of you who have technology, if you go on the internet, either last week or this week, an article came out that said that Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley executives are not allowing their children to use technology. The people who make the technology are not allowing their until children to use the technology. And I found that. 15. Until they are 15. 15. Thanks for reminding yes, me. Until they are 15. They allow them to use and it. I found, yes, and I found that article. I read it and I read it over and I printed it and I highlighted a whole lot of things in it because I found it so interesting. The people, and Steve Jobs, apparently, who was the mastermind behind Apple, would not allow his children to use technology. We've come to that end of our session. We've come to the end of the Lenten Educational Series of 2018. We have had a very, very inspiring set of lectures, and it is nice to know that the person who opened the batting is back here to see the final wicket being bowled, Dr. June Samuels. <laughs> We've had a very inspiring set of lectures. We have two of them, three of them recorded, and we are hoping that we'll be able to share them with you in the not too distant future. I think it is only fitting, kindly of sit please, that we should now ask the president of the ECW, representative of the parenting of the parish, to, give, to move the vote of thanks. Harder words to use, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, this evening culminates our sessions, our um, Lenten series on um, different forms of education, and I'm sure those of us who have been able to make, if not all of it, most of it, was extremely blessed. We were extremely blessed with all the speakers. Um, I remember being here for Dr. Samuel, and I went home with my head full of ideas and trying to examine if I was suffering from PTSD after Orma. But you know, those were sessions that were very enlightening. They were not only enlightening, they were very informative. And so we come to this evening, and this evening is no exception, with our very own Sister Cicely Malone. I have had experience, I've spoken to her not, you know, on numerous occasions, but I remember that initial meeting we had um, when Fadora called, the, it was the president of the PTAs for the primary and the secondary school, and um, some of us from the ECW, and Mrs. Malone. And um, Father, it was in December, December 6th, yes. <laughs> and I remembered, and I, you know, I sat down there in that meeting, and I listened to her. And coming away from that meeting, you came away with not only a lot of knowledge, because you know she knows what is going on, especially because she deals with the young people on a daily basis, and not only regular young people, challenging young people. So you know that she knows what she's talking about. 
And so when she, I saw her name listed to do this session, I couldn't miss it. I had to be here. And she has been extremely profound. And I'm sure that most of us, I have raised children and they are adults, but I do have grandchildren. And yes, I have two great grandchildren. But you know, um, even in trying to help the younger generation in rearing their children, I have heard my own said to me, where you think you're gonna beat them like how you used to beat us? You see, the thing is, what has happened is that parents now, they are, yes, you have to be friendly with children, but you don't have to be friends with them and don't discipline them. You have to. And as Mrs. Malone said, when you rear your children, you're not rearing them for now. You're rearing them for the future. And I remember coming here from Montserrat, and my kids couldn't watch TV during the week. They were enrolled at the Indus Adams Primary School, and Monday to Friday was your chores and your homework. You couldn't watch no TV. When they finished the task on a Saturday morning, I allowed them to watch a certain amount of television. But they spent time in board games, they spent time in doing puzzles, and Sunday morning was church morning, so no time for TV. Now, I am not saying I was a perfect parent. Oh, far from that. But if we don't start somewhere, we're going to get nowhere. And so with what she has told us this evening, I could only say thank you, thank you, thank you. Because I am sure uh, all of us here realize where she's coming from. We are in trouble and we need help. And we got to do something about it. And we're better to start that within the church, going into the community. And so, Mrs. Malone, a hearty thank you for all you did this evening. And God bless you as you continue your ministry. I thank all of you for coming out. Wish it could have been more, more parents here. But thank you, and God bless you. Have a wonderful evening, and enjoy the rest of the week. Thanks.